Welcome to the Crypto Compliance Podcast by Gatenauts. Hi, this is Pavel Kuskovsky, Crypto Compliance. I'm here with Vasily Vidmanov, uh, Chief Operating Officer of uh, AML Bot. I'm ple- please, pleased to meet you, Vasily. Nice to meet you, Pavel. Thanks for the invite. So I think you know it's good to start. You know, ch- tell me more about your your experience. You know, in uh, in AML Bot, what you guys are doing, and then we can tap on on various subjects which I know that you are uh, experts on. Sure. Yeah. So maybe just also a little brief about myself. So my name is Vasily. I'm a CEO of AML Bot. Um, I have a transition to the crypto compliance from the traditional compliance space. I used to work in the tax compliance and then I was able basically to connect uh, my profession with my hobby. So I was uh, always excited about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And then I was able to join the crypto compliance industry. So in AMLBot, uh, we provide uh, crypto compliance solutions to crypto businesses. Um, our main product is KYT, so know your transaction. And at our main strategy and goal, uh, we really aim to be a one-stop compliance solution for crypto businesses. So that's why we also have added KYC services, so the standard KYC service, uh, as well as we have an investigation department that deals with the stolen crypto. Uh, and we also have a consulting department that helps, uh, especially startups, to get a license, to get the processes uh, in order, um, and so on. So this is where we are right now. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so I think you know. Let's dive into the the cyber. I'm very curious about your opinion about cybersecurity and forensics, and I know that you've been just in the the forum in Cy- in cyber Europe. Um, tell me, and I mean, I saw your post, right? And in the post, you're saying that there's a lot of Web two companies interested in what what Web three companies are proposing, right? And there is, I agree that there is some, you know, I think extensive knowledge in Web three, which is very much applicable um, into Web two area. Tell me what what's your view on this? Yeah, so. I would start by saying that uh, like cybersecurity is something that applies to web both to web two and web three, uh, and uh, both, so to speak, the traditional companies in the web two recognize the need for uh, the cybersecurity, and even so, more the web three companies uh, because like. Uh, most of the Web3 businesses dealing with a cryptocurrency and smart contracts. And this is a really uh, new technology. And um, it didn't ha- it didn't have like the test of time. So it is very uh, vulnerable for various cyber attacks. So the Web3 space uh, sees this as an internal, internal threat. And we can also see that in lots of hacks that are happening, especially when the bull market is is booming, there are more and more exploits and there are really a number of unique exploits, right? When uh, you can manipulate the price within the protocol in order to exploit it, in order to drain the pool. So sometimes it's not even the hack, so to speak, but just like a clever kind of evil genius tactics to exploit something. Um, This was kind of like one aspect. And the second aspect is the transition from the fiat world to the crypto world in terms of the law enforcement. Uh, Because, I mean, in Web3, we usually say like, one month in Web3, it's like a year in uh, Web2 or in a traditional company because everything is moving super fast. And the same applies kind of to the cybersecurity side of the things that uh, once you have an exploit or once the funds are stolen, uh, you need to act really fast. And this also applies to the law enforcement. So 
Uh, we also discussed that some of the processes that the law enforcement have when you have to get multiple approvals in order to investigate something, they don't really work in Web3. And this really just boosts the criminal activity because a lot of the criminals in uh, crypto and Web3 in particular are, are getting away uh, with, with what they're doing. Yeah, I remember my time in, in Coinfin when we, I think in the biggest problem for us was, was not tracing per se, because I think this is this is something that it's it's once you have technology, you almost can out outpace any criminals or any, you know, scammers in terms of fund transition and like kind of distribution of funds. But then, you know, getting subpoenas and suing different companies in different jurisdictions, recovering, I mean, the even in terms of treatment of the assets is 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 difficult right so that's something you know is which is really involving and i you know i'm definitely want to know your opinion um on this but before jumping on this uh, let's talk about blockchain forensics how does blockchain forensic work uh, and what are the key techniques involved in analyzing blockchain transactions yeah uh, thank you so when we're talking about the blockchain, forensics is, in simple terms, is basically analyzing the blockchain. And as we understand, the blockchain is a public ledger available to everyone. And kind of the only pro the only problem that you face when you're just simply looking at it is that you just see some set of numbers and letters which represent the wallets. And they don't really make sense because you just see the transfer of values between those wallets. So what the blockchain forensics aim to do is aim to make sense of it and to understand uh, who is behind this uh, particular wallet, where the funds are originating and where they're moving to. So within the blockchain forensics, we can say that we can have uh, a private wallet this is a wallet that usually have less transactions, so it looks like it belongs to some individual. And then we have a service wallet uh, or let's say like a set of wallets uh, that belong to some sort of an entity. So this entity can be an exchange, exchange service, marketplace, and also on the illicit side, it can be a dark market, a mixer, and so on. So the... Blockchain forensics, uh, one of the most important um, terms within the blockchain or, uh, forensics is uh, clustering, uh, because uh, by doing clustering, you can take um, the wallets that belong to one entity and you can uh, categorize it. So, for example, you can have a category exchange and you can take all of the wallets that belong to Binance and name this category Binance. And you can also assign a risk score to this entity. And once you will be looking in the blockchain transactions, usually in the specialized software, uh, you can see that the funds are moving usually between those clusters, right? So I just gave an example of like a low risk cluster, but there are also high risk clusters like a dark market, for example. An obvious question you, you would you would have here, right? You know, how are you dealing with mixers, anonymizer, switching bef between different blockchains, you know, bridges, all the stuff. It's 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 a complicated area, right? And if someone, I mean, what what are the let's say the biggest challenges of the investigators investigators right now in in this area? Yeah, that's that's definitely true. So um, you also need to distinguish, for example, between bridges and mixers, uh, because and you also need to understand how they work. So uh, if we're talking about the bridges, uh, generally by analyzing the code of the bridge, it's um, it is usually easy to find the input and output transactions. Of course, it doesn't apply to all of the bridges, but to most of them. Uh, if we're dealing with mixers, then this is when um, the kind of the life of the <laughs> investigator becomes hard. Uh, because if we're talking about Bitcoin, there are three or four 
types of kind of mixing uh, technologies. Uh, and if you want to demix, you need to use uh, usually specialized software that not many people have access to. I know that the law enforcement, they especially like the secret agencies, they do have an access to such software. And even with such software, you just get the uh, probabilities because um, it is impossible to demix something with a 100% degree of certainty. So you just get the probable results. And then by analyzing, for example, the behavior of the hacker or the hacker's group, you can see which uh, output of the mixer is is likely to be the one that, that, that you're looking for. So of course, it's, um, it's a challenge. Uh, and the other challenge is the use of the privacy coins. So Monero is un untraceable, for example. Um, Zcash has two modes, kind of the private mode and the public mode. Uh, so of course you can investigate the public mode, but the private mode is, is um, very hard to trace. So, um, but you also have to understand that um, the hackers, they, when they use the mixer or the privacy coin, it really reduces their chances to launder the funds in the end because the goal of the hacker is to um, take the funds, hide the trail of those funds, and then cash them out somewhere. So all of the regulated exchanges and exchange services, they use blockchain analytics uh, in order to prevent money laundering. So when an exchange will be receiving funds from a mixer, with a high degree of probability, they will freeze those funds, right? And we see now a trend where the major exchanges delisting the privacy coin again for, for the same reason of money laundering. Yeah, I think recent case of Samuro, Samu, uh, Samurai wallet, right, is, is interesting. And I remember, I think it was five or six years ago when Samurai wallet started. Actually, there's very kind of, um, how do you say, uh, putting some nodes, oh, we're going to be anonymous. And I remember they start poking us at CoinFilm, right? In terms of, oh, you guys cannot trace us and you cannot do anything with us. And I remember, I remember we started, you know, doing small transactions with, with this wallet and start, start starting mm -hmm. to figure out um, the model they apply for uh, token anonymization, mixer, mixering, right? And it turns out that we learned the, the internal process, right? That's one side, you know. So we actually, after I think, you know, half a year of of, of testing, uh, at that point of time, we didn't have sophisticated technology as we had later. But you know, there's actually we managed to decompose the the logic they applied internally. It was funny mm -hmm. to see, you know, because they still people still believe that you know, oh, you can do anonymization, mixing, and all this stuff. Majority of majority of the mixers would be kind of either almost I mean in in my view set up directly by agencies right or you know heavily cooperating with agencies <laughs> which is yeah. is really interesting you know I think the biggest the biggest problem right now in terms of AML uh, is actually the centralized exchanges right centralized exchanges are kind of the biggest mixers which you have, especially when they are well established in the offshore jurisdiction, when it's very difficult to get subpoena. I think it's, it's, yeah. it's very interesting, uh, you know, to see how, how it works. So in terms of like, where do you think we are as an, as industry? Do, do you see more cases? Because I remember recovering assets was actually the difficult part, right? So, have you managed to recover assets or are you close to close to do this or you know you see the change actually in the global framework yeah so that's that's a great question and i think that is still kind of the bottleneck of the whole yeah. industry uh and there are various reasons for that so from our experience it largely depends on the jurisdiction and on the actual agency 
and also yep. on the amount stolen. So unfortunately, as of today, I would say if you lose like less than 50K dollars, uh, it's very challenging uh, to make the law enforcement to take your case. Unfortunately. I think, you know, 50,000 50, is still good. You know, I remember, you know, we had, when we did this, you know, many years ago, some, some uh, bigger cases, 100 million was the minimum. <laughs> so it was really, I mean, so it changed. It's good. You know, yeah. I think, you know, 50,000 yeah. is actually, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm giving Bitcoin. a very, a very general number. Again, it depends on the jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Yeah. And, uh, for example, if we will talk about the United States, uh, sometimes it happens that if you want the FBI to work on the case, they have a certain threshold. Mm. So if you're under the, th which is pretty large. So if you're under the threshold, you have to go to the local police and they're not equipped sometimes even to handle the cases. So then is, I think this is like the point where um, the investigation companies come into play uh, and they try to present the information about like how the funds were moved uh, by adding like the um, links to the blockchain so mm -hmm. the police officer can verify it. Also explaining the process of communicating with an exchange, right? Because most of the exchanges, they even have like a specialized portals for the, for, for the law enforcement where they exchange the exchange the data so it is kind of slowly uh moving in the right direction but as i said a lot of the jurisdictions still do not know how to handle the crypto cases and they tend to dismiss them um actually we um had have some presence in india so we work closely with a with an indian law enforcement and we have even done the first crypto recovery in india and well done. it was funny that thank you that they had an access to the tools, but they didn't know how to use them. Yeah. So this is also like a part where a lot of training uh, needs to be done uh, in respect to in respect to the law enforcement, teaching them, because in the end, from the law enforcement perspective, it's easier to trace stolen, let's say, Bitcoin than a stolen car, right? Because it is mm. all on the blockchain. You just need to understand how blockchain works, how exchanges operate, right? There is a deposit wallet, there is a hot wallet, um, how to use the tools uh, in order to investigate and just be just be willing to do it. So, yeah. So let's focus on investigations. Um, I mean, you you said you say you co you cooperate with different law enforcement in different countries to kind of prepare documents for them or engage them in and you see they are you know willing to cooperate on this uh, are they helpful or you most likely see this as being dismissed because they don't have knowledge experience tool or you know simply time well now uh, we we're seeing that especially like year after year more and more of the law enforcement they at least register the case and try to work on it so we see a positive dynamics there and of course what we're trying to do from our side is we're trying to prepare like the expert report that where they can see the movements of the funds and the target uh, destination of the stolen funds because actually this is the whole logic of the investigation is to trace the stolen funds or the funds that you send to a scam and then to freeze them on um, a centralized exchange or exchange service, right? Um, and then, of course, the the law enforcement they will need to initiate the recovery process with with that particular entity. And do you, I mean I know one case which was used where NFT was used to send subpoena, right? Uh, via uh, NFT, it happened from the UK, I believe. Um, you know, some of my colleagues were involved in this. Um, do you see this type of new thing coming in in here, or we still play, let's say, technology and kind of 
you know, replicate the, the, the old way of solving problems, right? Because you effectively could think of, you know, but if you send to the network freezing order or, you know, injunction, right? Um, you could actually potentially achieve, uh, let's say, the result of, you know, the assets being uh, frozen, right? I think, you know, same mm -hmm. happened with Tether at some point and USDT where Tether itself, you know, start communicating to the network that, you know, these assets are being involved in some of the, you know, illegal activity. I think, you know, terrorist financing, and then you, we need to, we need to stop it as a, at the protocol level. So do you, do you see this type of innovation coming in or are we still, you know, in old, old school way of solving problems? It's web, web well, one, I would say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the current stage, we are definitely a, a bit behind because as you said in the beginning, the exchanges, even when you freeze the assets there, they like to play the jurisdiction game yeah. uh, where they say, oh, like we are under the loss of this and this country and uh, from your country, we don't even have to reply to the request. So that's that's also a problem. Uh, regarding the technology, I mean, I think we're also first, like we need to have even the general police officers that work for the police departments, not, not on the higher state agency, where they usually are, we are more well equipped to handle the crypto cases. They first need to understand what is an NFT, right? Because I think if you ask uh, a lot of the police officers, they will not know what is it. So it will be hard for them to send it as a subpoena without even having like a basic crypto knowledge. So I think this is a step one. And then of course, the second logical step is to use uh, innovative approaches. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great idea to send a subpoena using an NFT, but as I, as I think we're still a bit behind globally, at least. Yeah. And I mean, this seems like it's a huge market, right? In terms of assets recovery on crypto. And, you know, I think this couple of big companies coming in um, in the next couple of years out of this crypto investigation, right? So where, I mean, how many you will typically have cases um, and how do you, how do you structure the, this case? Is it someone, you know, paying you up front, you know, then you look at the case because this is typically involved or you look at the numbers involved and then you make decision. What's, what's the process? How you, how you can be engaged? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. So we tend to get like at least 10 to 15 requests every day. Every uh, day. Yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> of course, for various amounts yeah. and for various reasons. Um, so what we try to do from our side, we take all of the cases uh, and we spend at least some time to do, as we say, pre-investigation, where we look at the case and we try to understand, are we able to help the client or not? Because in some cases we are truly not able to help the client, then it will not, it will take us like maybe 30 minutes to understand that. So we d dismiss this case right away. And if we're able to help the client, we kind of do this free pre-investigation and we try to get on the call with the client to explain the process because the crypto recovery process is not very easy. And there are many parts that are involved, right? So from, from our side, of course, uh, I think the cases that we take, we solve them all. So we find out where the funds are headed, find out where the funds are going. Uh, usually we're able to temporarily freeze the funds somewhere, right? Because we can mark uh, the wallets as having the stolen funds. Um, and then in the end, then the law enforcement need to play their role in order to recover those funds. So we try to discuss like all of those questions with with the victim and so the victim understands the process and that there are many parts of this process and then if the victim is willing to proceed yeah we usually take uh, some funds to do the investigation and prepare the report and then uh, we also take a success fee 
how often do you have a victim being perpetrator <laughs> out of your experience? <laughs> Because I, well, I, you know, we always had, you know, we are thinking, you know, if someone is yeah. making this up or it's actually, you know, real yeah. person. Yeah, it's uh, it's always a good question. So of course we understand that this is a, like a risk. So with all of our clients that we help, we uh, do the KYC, and also we try to get on the call, like to see that it's the actual person that we are talking with, and of course we require them to file a police report then okay. it kind of serves as a proof that they they really lost the funds. So that's okay, so, that's how we're trying to eliminate this. So effectively, so the for example, point would be the, the, if the, the client the, tells us that, no, we don't want to do the KYC, I'm not going to file the police report, we, we are not working in such case. Yeah, so that's interesting that you, you make this step. Local police, right? Kind of, you know, in the country where you are residing, okay? Yeah. So let's move to to the crypto scams. I think you know this is this is huge topic which we probably can spend you know hours. <laughs> can you explain some of the mo- most common types of crypto scams that we should be aware of, which are you know existing for some time and which are new? What's your what's your mm-hmm. let's say view on this? Well, if you may, I just want to take one step back and just to just to have even a broader overview for people, uh, because I think it's also important to understand that basically like there are three, let's say, uh, well, let's say four ways how you can lose your crypto. So the first way is you just lose your private keys and they you cannot find them. So we cannot help here. Yeah. I know this case, you know, quite well. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very uh, frustrating, but this is kind of the price you have to pay for self custody. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then there are three other ca- cases that we see. So first of all, you get a hacked. Uh, I will talk after this. There are many ways you can get hacked, and how someone can steal your funds. Uh, then you can voluntarily send the funds to a scammer so you are getting scammed and you are the one who actually sends those funds and then the third case that not many people know about but it's also kind of sometimes it creates a lot of problems it's when your funds are getting frozen on the exchange for various reasons so i think the most cases that we see is the crypto scams and the direct theft and maybe 5% of the cases we see where uh, people got their funds frozen on the exchange. Right. So if we're talking about like the crypto scams, of course, like in 2017, it was the ICOs where people just send their funds, hoping that they will get some tokens back. Yeah. Um, then we have a very big scam nowadays is the Roman scam. So typically, uh, guys get romance, scammed, but, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah, very like very interestingly that it's usually the IT guys who get scammed, and they get kind of caught on Asian woman for some for some reason. This is just I'm uh, standard giving approach, the fact right? here. Yeah, standard approach. So uh, I can even talk about some cases. So. We had a case where the guy met a girl on Tinder. Uh, they started talking. And then basically she had some sort of a problem with your iPad. And it was a very easy one. So he kind of helped her to fix that problem. And as a thank you, she said that her brother has this amazing investment opportunity. And this is how the guy lost 300K. Um So this is like how they get you hooked emotionally, right? So they build trust with you and then they feel, basically you feel that uh, this this is like your love or something and uh, you send money to a scam. Uh, The other one that is very big nowadays is called big butchering. So this is a very usually used by more like advanced hackers, almost like a syndicate of hackers. So what they do, they typically target high net worth individuals, usually older ones that have limit that have money, but they have limited knowledge about crypto. 
So they even teach them like how to buy cryptocurrency on Coinbase or OKX and then make them transfer this cryptocurrency to their establishment, so to speak. Um, usually they even have uh, platforms built where you see like your profit increasing every day. But of course, it's not the real profit. It's just the numbers on your screen. And sometimes they even let you withdraw small amounts of funds. So we had a client, he was actually able to withdraw, I think, one or two K dollars. And then when he wanted to withdraw more, this is kind of where the game starts. So at first they tell you that they have some technical issues. Then they tell you that you need to pay a tax. Uh, there is like some profit tax. Uh, then they tell you that your credit score is low. So they try to get, and in order to unfreeze the funds, you need to send them more and more, more and more funds, basically. So this is why it's called pig butchering because they butcher <laughs> pig as much as possible to get the funds from. And we even saw the cases that it even goes so far that after they 100% sure that they're scammed, they have fake investigation and recovery services contacting them, helping, um, trying to kind of saying that they will help them to recover the funds. So, and then they got scammed again by those wow. other services as well. So Amazing. that's why I'm saying this, this hacks are like the most uh, devastating because they hack you like on every step of the road. And of course, when we deal with, uh, with such victims, they usually don't have any, any trust. So, uh, they don't trust us. They don't trust anyone anymore. So that's why it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very, like a big thing. Yeah, uh, you know, do you think it's actually like everyone can be subject to this? It's just a matter of time and kind of, um, you know, technique they're going to use against you especially nowadays when you have AI and you can, you know, they can create personalities and, you know, all this stuff or just when you apply common sense, you, you're good, you know, because typically, I mean, if you have Asian women reaching, reaching out to you on, you know, Telegram, right. And say, you know, like in broken, you know, uh, Polish or, you know, in broken English, you know, you know, hello, how are you? All this stuff. That's kind of, you cannot believe that it's, it's actually real, mm -hmm. right? You know, so do you think it's just a matter of time they're going to hook you on something or you can actually apply common sense and, and, you know, stay away from this? Well, but you, like you can apply and you should apply common sense, stay away from this. As I said, the problem is that they target the people that do not even understand how crypto works. Uh, so there, but you said uh, IT like, people would be, would be scammed as well. Right. Oh uh, yeah. If, if we're talking about the Roman scam, yes, but I was also saying about it's almost like applying right scam. technique in the area, which you are not expert, right. Or you, yeah. you are quite blunt, and right. You, you also have to be careful. We, um, um, one of my friends, she got scammed, uh, that, uh, her boss, she thought because so there was an individual he created telegram account was almost the same telegram handle as her boss just changed yeah. one letter and of course she didn't notice that and maybe they didn't have like a lot of the chat history so she didn't find it suspicious that it was like a fresh message and he told her hey sorry i'm running late to the office can you buy this amazon card to me uh, for me and she actually did it and it turned out to be a scam. So yeah. uh, you, you have to an anticipate that it can really come from every angle. And of course you need to be very careful with almost everything nowadays. Especially when you're transferring funds to someone, right? Especially when you're transferring the funds. Yeah. yeah and I, you know, I think, you know, um, the pig butchering is something that I saw that the average is around 60,000 or 200,000 pounds, uh, an average scam. Mm -hmm. And you effectively need to run, you know, you try on, you know, a couple of hundreds or thousands, uh, and then you focus on two, three cases a month and you're pretty good, right? So that's something which yeah. is also, you know, the, the number game. So there's many yeah, cases and big, big profit coming in. Um, and then almost, 
Like then, if you if you think about it, but you cannot recover these funds, right? Uh, it, or it's very difficult to recover these funds, and especially when we are below the target. I mean, below mm-hmm. the the threshold. It's almost like there's no punishment to these guys, right? It's almost like they walk free and you can do nothing to to them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, from also from my experience, kind of uh, the national agencies like Europol and Interpol, because those networks are usually operate globally. So, like once the network gets too big, usually the like the national law enforcement and secret services, they cooperate and they okay. bust those operations. So it's, but for the, for the smaller scams, yeah, it's um, becomes really hard to recover. And a lot of them, unfortunately now uh, are getting away with that. Okay. And what, what is the role of social engineering in this? I mean, how how much would you contribute to crypto? How much would you contribute to, or you know, how crypto works, or how do you? I mean, social engineering. How important it is? Um, yeah. So, social engineering aspect is kind of the key here, but within the uh, within uh, those cases, sometimes we have cases where the victim sends half in fiat and half in cryptocurrency. So. Um, of course, they use cryptocurrency as method to launder the funds, right? Because when you send to someone's bank account, there is always an entity or an individual attached to it. So in theory, it is easier for the police to investigate. Uh, so I think, but yeah, the, like the social I- engineering plays a key part and like, yeah, they use crypto as an easy method to launder the funds, but there are also like the fiat part that is usually involved in that. And what would you suggest is the, if you would say, this is this is the key principles of kind of uh, working in crypto and staying safe. Is there any like, you know, iron principle, you would say, if you apply this, you're going to be 100% all right. Uh, or, I mean, like, I don't know, like, um, using ledger, right? So the, mm-hmm. the, let's say, how do you say, uh, hardware wallet as opposed to any software wallet or browser wallet, mm-hmm. uh, what would you suggest is the, the best way to, uh, not to get hacked or to be safe? Yeah. Well, the first thing is that you need to assume that you will, you will get hacked. Like, okay. And you you will already remove a big burden from your shoulder. So you that's why because when you are getting hacked, uh, then you think of the ways how you can mitigate it and you can act fast rather than being in a shock and just panicking, right? So already assume that there is a high degree of chance that you will get hacked at some point, especially as you are if you are an active user of DeFi if you are no farming airdrops and so on. Uh, So you always have to think of the risk of mitigating your loss. Uh, And this is, by the way, the approach that I learned from a lot of OSINT companies, because they say to everyone that just assume that you have a data breach already. So just think of the ways how to mitigate it. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good and like realistic approach. Um, The second thing is of course, being aware of what can happen and from which angle it can come, right? So we discuss the social engineering, the crypto scams, and then there are also, for example, uh, dusting attack or address poisoning, right? When you receive, when you send um, a big amount of crypto to one address and then immediately you receive like 0.1 cent from an address that have a very similar beginning and ending, Right, but it yeah. it is still a different address because the uh, uh, symbols in the in the middle are different, uh, and then a lot of users. I mean, now it's not that big as it used before because a lot of the wallets already have a protection against it. They basically show it as a scam transaction. But when it just started, we had lots of cases every week, where especially a lot of like OTC guys and people that sent 
USDT daily because what they tend to do is they just tend to copy ah. the address from the last transaction. And this is right. a lot of them got hooked for many millions and I think billions of dollars. So being aware of how DeFi works, right? So when you're using a decentralized exchange and interacting with a smart contract, you're giving a permission for a smart contract to take, like if we say in the simple terms, to take the funds from your account, right? And to exchange them to something else. So if this smart contract gets hacked, right? Or, or uh, the access to the smart contract is compromised, then if you had the active permission for this smart contract, then the hacker can exploit you by taking the funds um, from your uh, from your MetaMask or any wallet with Web3 connectivity. So it is a good practice to revoke the approvals even from the most popular uh, smart contracts. Uh, also understand that there are uh, a lot of viruses, uh, so to speak, stealers, and they're usually targeted on the um, extension wallets. So like on MetaMasks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so what yeah. they do is they steal kind of uh, all of your browser extensions and all of your cookies, and then they try to brute force the password that you have to this MetaMask, right? So this can be prevented by having a hardware wallet because by having a ledger, you can also use Web3 with your hardware wallet. And my suggestion is also to have at least two to three hardware wallets. Again, just to spread, kind of don't put all of your eggs in the same basket, just to spread them. So if one gets compromised, then uh, you can hope that the others won't. Uh, yeah, so... I think Which... also there are like many resources like revoke cash <clears throat> that help you to revoke approvals and so on. And which uh, blockchain, is there any blockchain you typically, I mean, I know that I think it was uh, Polygon for some time, which the, the creation and, you know, the, the price of transaction was so small that actually, you know, if you created NFT, there was like hundreds immediately created, which were very similar to the to the original one. So this type of scams were happening. Do you see any particular blockchain being used or is just, you know, typically Ethereum and ERC20 tokens, which are the most common, let's say, uh, to be to be hacked or, you know, to be scammed on? Mm -hmm. So uh, now it's kind of the airdrop season, right? So it's, okay. it's a bit different than before. Uh, before we had this kind of airdrop mania, <clears throat> mostly we had cases where uh, people would lose their USDT, Bitcoin, right. and Ethereum. Now, since there is this kind of airdrop mania, sometimes we get in cases, because when you farm airdrops, you create a lot of wallets. So we have clients yeah. with 500, 600 wallets with... 20, 20 different blockchains, AVAX, Linear, ZK Sync. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it takes like several days just to estimate how much they lost. So now in this like airdrop season, a lot of the EVM networks uh, have been targeted because people who farm airdrops, they usually have assets on a lot of blockchains. And of course, it's just the same wallet. So once yeah. they compromise, the keys to to your wallet they can steal the assets on all of the blockchains interesting so you you've been busy for for <laughs> some time already right yeah yeah for sure and i think you know this is this is this is great area vasily thank you very much for your time um it was thank excellent you, to have you there's going to be you know really interesting episode and a lot of let's say practical knowledge to uh you know hopefully not the pigs on the street, so they wouldn't be butchered. <laughs> anyway, Vasily, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me, and uh, until next time. Crypto Compliance, brought to you by GateKnox.